You know, I didn't ask that. I'll ask it. I'll ask it now. What I gotta know. Um, what would it be for you? Um, let me think. Um, I would guess it's something about. Uh, I would guess it's something about trend following. Something about relative strength would be my guess. Well, that would have that would have been it. But now it's uh, never confuse brains with a bull market. Bull market. <laughs>welcome to the latest edition of behind the charts this is dave keller here at stock charts in redmond washington this season season two of behind the charts is filled with some amazing conversations with some people that have had incredible careers in the financial industry some of which are still just in producing incredible content and wisdom and expertise for their clients and mark chaikin our next conversation is certainly one of those mark is the founder and ceo of chaikin analytics he's based in the northeast in connecticut uh, but uh, we had a fantastic conversation about how he really went from using learning technical analysis and using technical analysis to really creating technical analysis, building out the technical toolkit. A lot of the things that we all, many of us take for granted, things like accumulation, distribution, the chicken oscillator, chicken money flow, and, uh, and so forth are really driven uh, by Mark's innovations and in trying to systematize some of these measures of uh, market trend. We talked a lot about the early pioneers in relative performance, relative strength, guys like uh, Levy, uh, who wrote a book in the uh, in the 1960s um, uh, explaining it. George Chestnut, who wrote about uh, creating a ranking system based on uh, on price trends. Marcus Chaikin those, has taken those sort of uh, innovations and evolved them into, uh, into a um, uh, a pretty successful career. Uh, his firm, Chicken Analytics, really works with in individual investors, financial advisors, helps them make sense of things by not just looking at the technicals, but also combining with them with fundamental analysis. We talked about a lot about fusing fundamental and technical with a with sort of a quantitative overlay to try to make sense of trend within the context of all the other drivers of stock prices. It's a fascinating, fascinating conversation. I hope you enjoy it here with Mark Chicken. Mark, it is so good to sit down with you today. Mark Chaikin from uh, Chaikin Analytics. Uh, thanks for giving us some time today. David, it's a distinct pleasure. Now, um, I, I think you are one person who most people know very well, um, whether from you and, and all the work that you've done. I, and I think of you as an educator. I think of someone who's, who's empowered other people to make better decisions, but also just the ways you've innovated. But I'm excited to, to give people a little bit of behind the scenes look at Kind of how you got started, how you got to this point. Can you start out, where are you from originally? I'm from Brooklyn, New York. I stayed there until I went off to college, uh, went to Brown University for four years in Providence, Rhode Island. Very good. And what first introduced you, what was your first introduction to the financial markets? The first job I had out of college was working for a commercial lender. They were called Factors. And mm -hmm. basically we financed... Um, manufacturing, garment manufacturing companies, and a number of them were public companies. And all the principals in this firm were trading the stock market. And that um, got me a lot more excited than worrying about accounts receivable. And so uh, one of the partners in this firm introduced me to some people uh, at Goldman Sachs. And uh, that didn't work out, but eventually I ended up at a firm called Shearson Hamill at their main office on 14 Wall Street. And as you got started, what was your introduction to technical analysis? Where did that fit in? Was that early on where you were introduced or does that come later? It was pretty early on. We sat right across from the New York Stock Exchange on top of a, a double day bookstore. And I went in and I said to the manager of the bookstore, look, I work upstairs and anytime a new book on stocks come in, please hold it aside for me and I'll stop <laughs> in on my way home. Well, the fundamental books were really dense. <laughs> and I, quite honestly, uh, even though I had taken one economics course in college, they just didn't interest me. But the technical analysis books, which promised everything, uh, you know, riches beyond your wildest dreams, really got me excited. So I, it was really, I learned technical analysis myself by just reading a ton of books. That's a good inspiration for those getting started now, hopefully. What, um, were there any early mentors in your career that stand out, people that sort of introduce you to, to things that uh, are part of your process now? 
in the mid 70s, I headed the options department at a firm called Tucker Anthony and RL Day. You're probably familiar with it. It's based in Boston and New York. Sure. And I was on the investment policy committee with a guy named Stanley Burge. And Stan Burge was really my first mentor. Uh, and what made him special was that he combined uh, quantitative analysis with technical analysis. He was very into money supply and uh, the uh, various uh, fundamental indicators that drove uh, the market in a macro sense. So Stan was really an inspiration because up until then I was doing technical analysis. I had been doing technical analysis since 1969. And the reason that I got interested in technical analysis, and this is sort of interesting, I got registered as a stockbroker on October 6th of 1966. It was the day a bear market ended. I lived sure. through a nine month bear market in my training program. <laughs> so for the first two and a half years of my career, every day was an uptick. And then 1969 happened. And I realized pretty quickly that without something else, and for me, something else became technical analysis, it would be impossible to protect client assets and my own sanity in a bear market. So it's interesting. I, I love talking with people about sort of their formative years as an investor and, and how that shapes their perspective. So you kind of got started toward the end of the go-go years, what we call them, right? And then into the 70s, which you know, you're going through the 74 low, you're going through you know, a pretty challenging period. What was that experience like sort of on the left side and the right side of, of going into that sort of secular bear market phase and then getting out of that? How did that, what did that experience mean for you? Well, that period you just described is actually two bear markets of between 18 and 24 months each. Mm. Uh, it was painful. Um, part of the reason was that the fundamental analysts at Shearson Hamill were really top grade. Many of them went on to start their own hedge funds or investment firms, but they stayed with their fundamental view all the way down. So if they liked the stock at 100, it was an even better buy at 60. <laughs> and typically they'd throw in the towel at 20. And if you're <laughs> laughing, we're, at some point, we're going to talk about what's going on now, I hope, because some of that is happening over and over again in the public media as we speak. And it's pretty mm -hmm. scary for me. It's fascinating, right? We'll, we'll certainly get to that. Now, when I think of you, Mark, I, I think of someone who's not just used the toolkit, but someone who's innovated and who's created things. And I, you know, a lot of the tools that, that for me and many others have become a standard part of the toolkit, just the idea of accumulation distribution, things like the chicken oscillator, chicken money flow. When was that? Was that in the 70s to 80s that you were creating those? When was that that you started to build out your own set of indicators? That was in the late 70s when the first uh, Apple computers and then the IBM PCs became available. And I was really inspired by the work of Larry Williams and Joe Granville, who did the original um, research into accumulation distribution. There was also a guy named David Bastian who did it on more of the institutional level. And I just started using computers to create something that built off what Larry Williams had done with his accumulation distribution. So I always reference him as sort of my long distance mentor. Uh, but it was really in 1982 when we put Shake and Money Flow into the uh, public domain that uh, I realized we could help investors by giving them a set of tools that could enable them to make more disciplined um, and more in, better informed investment decisions. You know, and it's fascinating. You, you know, if, if our viewers know their market history, you released those in 1982, you said, and that's just before 1983 when the Dow finally got above 1000 for good, right? It sort of went from there. Tell me, can you tell me about that period when, when the market's breaking to new highs? And obviously, you didn't know it was going to be a, you know, a multi decade bull market, but w were there signs that made you feel like this was the beginning of something? More or were you, was it more of a cautious wait and see mode disbelief after going through the 70s? Well, we had just been through the Hunt Silver crisis, if you, if you remember back to, I think, 79 to 81. And so it did feel like something good was happening. But I want to take you back to um, really the mid 60s. The first book that really influenced me in terms of technical analysis was a PhD thesis by a guy named Robert Levy called the relative strength concept of investing. So before Shake and Money Flow, I did a major research project validating his thesis, proving 
to myself that stocks that have outperformed the market over the last six months are going to continue to outperform the market. Uh, so when we got into the 1980s, I was at Drexel Burnham, had access to one of the only the, the two quantitative databases on Wall Street. A guy named George Douglas um, started something called Deus and actually gave me access as a retail stockbroker to that database. And that's where I combine shake and money flow with relative strength, with earnings momentum, which was George's uh, sort of signature research uh, in terms of earnings surprises and earnings momentum. So yeah, the 80s felt different to me because there was computer power and I had access to, to more resources than I had ever had. You know, Levy's work is, is fantastic. I mean, really, I feel like much of what many of us use in terms of just the concept of relative strength, right? Leaning into winners and leaning away from losers. I think his, his work was probably, I mean, the first that I had read that, that sort of validated that. It's interesting that that was an inspiration to what you do. I'd love to ask you what, how you would describe your investment process. Because when I think of you and, and, and how I followed your work, Mark, it's, it really is a hybrid. It's not a pure technical, you know, look at the charts and don't worry about anything else. It really is combining, you know, uh, price strength, earning strength, and sort of putting it all together. How would you sort of summarize your process of analyzing stocks at this point? My process is really a top-down process. It starts with the trend of the market, but I, I really, I try and make it easy. You know, price is your best indicator when you're looking at trends. So I'm looking for broad trends, higher highs and higher lows, something that we've been experiencing since May. But where the analysis really gets valuable is looking at sector and industry group strength. And once I've zeroed in on strong sectors, but more importantly, strong industry groups, because as you know, uh, when you look at the 11 sectors that comprise the S&P 500 index, there's a lot of sort of bundling that goes on. Either one stock has an outsized influence or as in consumer discretionary, you have everything from cars to home builders to retail. So uh, when you get down to the industry group level and then do some technical analysis, relative strength and absolute momentum analysis, you give yourself a look under the hood of what the market's doing. And that's sort of a macro view because many institutional investors, and I'm sure you're familiar with this from your years at Fidelity, take a very similar approach. Once I've identified the strong industry groups, and we use something called the Chaikin Power Gauge Rating, which combines fundamentals and technicals on the industry group ETFs, I then zero in on the strongest stocks in the strong industry groups. And uh, that technique goes all the way back to a guy named George Chestnut, who had something called American Investors Fund in the 1950s. And that fund was populated solely with strong stocks and strong industry groups. And then research from a lot of other people over the years has validated the idea that investing in strong stocks and strong industry groups gives your investment results a tailwind. And for me, I wanna combine fundamentals and technicals. So whatever indicator your viewer is using to measure fundamentals, is important because technicals just benefit so much from having a fundamental view to share the stage with. You mentioned George Chestnut. His name also came up in our conversation with uh, Ralph Acampora um, oh, wow. for a similar reason. So I'm, I'm hoping, hopefully, you know, names like that that maybe have fallen off the list. I hope people dig into a little more and, and learn some of their contributions to, uh, to what we all do for sure. I actually looked at a reprint of his book that I bought from, um, company out in California that does reprints. It was published in 1961. And he goes into chapter and verse on how to do this relative rankings, something that the O'Neill service is doing, something that you guys do with Scooter uh, yep. on stockcharts.com. So there's nothing new in the world every because human nature is the same. <laughs> there it is. Now, you mentioned the um, the Chaikin power gauge, and I know on Stock Charts ACP, it's super exciting to have an ACP plugin for Chaikin Analytics that's going to feature that power gauge ranking, right, which is a way of of, uh, of summarizing the conditions for a stock. How would you, you know, could you just give us a brief overview? How do you use that rating? How does that fit into how you think about a particular stock? When I'm looking at stocks, I want stocks that have a bullish fundamental potential going forward. So we've got a 20 stock. 20 factor indicator called the Chaikin Power Gauge has been in the market for 10 years. It's the 10th anniversary 
uh, as we speak. And it looks at value, growth, uh, what I call sentiment factors, and then 15% technicals. And that's my go-to indicator. That and industry group strength mm. are my starting point, my launching pad for finding stocks that I want to invest in. Now, um, if we could look back as you're looking back through a, a very successful career, I would argue as an investor, as a technical analyst, can you share with us a mistake, share with us a mistake that you experienced that you learned from the most over your, uh, your career? Well, I'll take you back to 1969. I shorted a stock named Four Seasons Nursing Homes. We were in a period very similar to what we saw in 1999 and 2000 and arguably happening again. Mm -hmm. And I shorted the stock at, new, at 100, which was its all time high. And I ended up covering it at 119 and 7 a so I'll never forget. And that was within a tick of the all time high. So for <laughs> me, it was, a, a, I shorted a thousand shares. I lost $20,000. That was an awful lot of money for me. I was um, 27 years old. And I've learned never short a stock making a new high. It's something that Justin Mamis uh, wrote a book about how to sell and when to sell. Uh, I learned that you've got to respect the market and let momentum play out before you uh, short something that you think is overvalued. Um, it, you know, everyone seems, I feel like successful investors I've known always have a painful story earlier on in their career. Thanks for sharing that with us. That's a good You're one. You're welcome. By the way, the company went bankrupt in 19. <laughs> uh, there were more than one stock like that. There was another stock called Levitt's Furniture. At one, Montgomery mm -hmm. Ward was the big catalog retailer. At one point, yeah. Levitt's Furniture with 19 stores had a bigger market cap than Montgomery <laughs> Ward. Do you see some of the patterns that we're seeing repeated now in the market? Well, so you've hinted a couple times at the current conditions. We're recording this sort of uh, late February 2021. Um, I'm reading a, bull re a, a book right now called Bull, which deals with the 1984 to 2004 sort of uh, period. And uh, I, I picked that up just thinking about where we're at now in terms of valuations. Talk us through your perspective now. What what are you seeing overall as we, you know, sort of are in mid first quarter of 2021? I'm seeing the Fed continuing to uh, provide a backstop for the stock market. We're seeing uh, yields go up and bond prices dropping because um, there's optimism about the reopening of the economy and also a sense if you look at some of the commodity indices that inflation is coming back. But on the other side of that, you have unbelievable speculation. And uh, there's one chart in particular that I'm looking at and it makes me very nervous. And that's the chart of the ARK Innovation Fund, ARKK. Uh, it's breaking down as we speak. Uh, when we got on this Recording the NASDAQ was down 3% and the ARK Innovation Fund was down 6%. $20 billion have flowed into that fund in the last month. Every dollar of that 20 billion is underwater right now. And I'm concerned that if we get redemptions in these ARK funds that they're gonna be net sellers of some of these big name stocks like Tesla where they have huge positions and that could weigh heavily on the market from a short term point of view. Yeah. What and, and so that that makes a ton of sense. I, I, I can't disagree with what you said. I and we're we're you know literally seeing some of that play out potentially this week. You know, longer term, as you think about, you know, the next year, the next couple of years, you mentioned the economy, you know, the economic conditions overall, obviously the coronavirus and and uh and 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 reopening the economy. Uh the Federal Reserve has essentially said even this week they'll do whatever they need to. What's your long-term perspective looking out? further than a short-term uh, correction. Long-term, are we still in a constructive pattern? Well, price-wise, we're clearly in a, in a bull market. And I look at the major brokerage firms to see what their earnings estimates are, recognizing that they're gonna be overly aggressive as we head into whenever the top is and forms. But right now, two of the major firms have a 185 estimate for the S&P for this year and 205 for next year. And it's pretty easy to conceptualize price targets between 4,300 and 5,000 based on zero short-term interest rates and earnings that are going to be significantly higher than they were in 2019 when the uh, bull market peaked, first bull market. 
It's uh, it's an interesting environment for sure. Now, as as you were talking about, I just I was looking at my notes. You you skipped one interesting part of your career that I'd love for you to talk a little bit about, which is FNN. If I remember right, in the early 1980s, you actually were involved with FNN, sort of the precursor of CNBC. Can you talk about how that came about and what that experience was like? It's early days of financial television, financial well, media. Where did you find that factoid? That's really interesting. I was thinking about that before we got on the air. Yeah. Um, I started working with a computerized program that a guy named Earl Bryan had written. Dr. Earl Bryan was, had been Secretary of Health, Education, and Welfare in Ronald Reagan's California cabinet. And he went with him to Washington. And I got introduced to him by a friend of Tucker Anthony. And he said, Mark, here's this research that I've been doing. I'm going to hand it off to you. It's a timeshare computer system. So I started tinkering with this model using it in the options analytics area. And one of the guys I worked with who was part of Earl's company introduced me to John Bollinger. But I was actually in Earl's office when he came back from a trip from California, threw a prospectus on my desk and said, Mark, take a look at this. And I said, what is this? It looks like a movie production company. He said, no, go to the back of it. And it was a business plan for Financial News Network. So uh, I met John Bollinger, Bill Griffith, recorded uh, live sessions out in California. They had a little shack on a, a beach house in Santa Monica. And uh, that started a 40 uh, year friendship with John Bollinger and, and got me uh, sort of public exposure for the first time. That's fantastic. At, at some point, maybe we'll convince you to share some of those early recordings that hopefully you have somewhere around you. <laughs> <laughs> well, the one I wish I had, I was lecturing at a, a CM, it was called the Market Technicians Association back then, as you know, yeah. uh, 1987, NYU University on stage was Ralph Akampura, a um, guy from Smith Barney, uh, Sue Burge from Tucker Anthony, myself, and uh, Tom, who's the guy who did the uh, pattern stuff uh, that Bloomberg wrote up. Uh, in one of their books, um, used by a lot of the institutions. He had the 13. Tom DeMarc. Tom DeMarc. So there were yep. five of us on the stage and it, it was a, a seminal event. And FNN called me and said, can you get down to the American Stock Exchange? I said, I'm right next door. And so I went down on the floor of the American Stock Exchange the day the market crashed and got interviewed, but that tape has disappeared. I mean, there were uh -huh. literally bodies on the floor. It was, <laughs> they were exhausted and I, I was there and I wish I had that tape because yeah. that, that's just a seminal moment. Wow. It's a fascinating look into uh, into financial market history, I think. So you, you know, as I think of your career, Mark, you've gone through really, I mean, you've seen, you've seen everything in some way. You've seen extended bull markets, extended bear market periods, and sort of everything in between. When you think about you and your approach and this toolkit that you've built around you, what what um, market environment is most challenging for you? Or is it all sort of the same? It's all the same game that you're just trying to answer. Is there a particular environment that is most challenging for you? Actually, the current environment, which I think mirrors 1999, 2000, yeah. Uh, is the most challenging. And the reason is the stocks that you like are what I call at the top of the page. You know, they've gone from lower left to upper right. Yeah. And right now you're talking about the cyclical stocks. Uh, four months ago, we were talking about the tech stocks. That's a tough environment because the, my tendency being a bit of a contrarian is to want to sell into strength. Yeah. And then you're sitting on cash uh, with no place to put it. So uh, it, it's a great environment if you're a buy and hold investor, mm. uh, but it's a little bit challenging if timing was ever a part of your toolkit. Great. <laughs> um, now, my column on stockcharts.com is called The Mindful Investor. So I'm curious, Mark, you, you come across as a very calm and collected uh, individual, uh, you know, dealing with massive uncertainty in the financial markets. What do you do to deal with that uncertainty to stay centered when things get crazy around you? You've got to have a game plan and that game plan has to incorporate a discipline. You've got to follow it every day. Uh, if you start shooting from the hip, if you start second guessing your methodology, uncertainty creeps in uh, when it shouldn't, when it can do you the most damage. I've, I've been saying 
consistently for the last five years because I write a weekly market letter to ignore the headlines. Hmm. And, you know, uncertainty is a fact of life for all of us, not just in the financial markets, but the headlines really exacerbate the emotional aspects of being an investor, whether you're a swing trader or a long-term investor. So I'd say for me, dealing with uncertainty is involved with having a game plan, disciplined approach to the markets, but also ignoring the headlines. Mm. Mark, this has been a fantastic, a fascinating look at you and your successful career uh, as an investor on Wall Street. Um, thank you so much for all the contributions you've made to the technical toolkit, to the technical analysis community. And uh, thanks so much for your time today. David, you're very kind. This was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Hey, Grayson Rhodes here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below. Maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're going to bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.